Galatians chapter 2. Let's pick up the reading there in verse 15. Galatians 2.15, Paul speaking to Peter here, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Let's pray. Father, we sang it, we confess it. Nothing, nothing compares to You. And nothing compares to Your Word. But we're thankful we do have a more sure prophetic Word. And we can open up this Word. And Lord, with the desire and hope that by Your Spirit You would make it real to us and penetrate our hearts and minds with Your truth. Lord, use it in ways that will magnify Your Son. I pray You'd help now and give liberty by Your Spirit. Lord, bless us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we're just going to simply pick up our thoughts from, from last week um, and continue making some, some observations of verse 20 as well as seek to explain some of what verse 21 is saying as we seek to wrap up chapter 2. And I'm, I look forward to getting to chapter 3 in our next message. And we ended last week giving some thought to this most wonderful phrase there in verse 20 who loved me and gave Himself for me. I feel like that verse can't be exhausted. But as I've I've thought upon it, I've I've thought about some here that are struggling uh, with assurance. And and even some who have struggled with this, the thought, the idea of God loving you. Because of either some sin in your life or in some cases just because of providential circumstances or sufferings or setbacks in your life. And I can't think of a better statement in all the Bible for Christians to lay hold of and sink their spiritual teeth into than this statement made right here by the Apostle. Speaking of the Son of God who who came to rescue and ransom undeserving sinners from their bondage to sin. Not saying, now let me tell you how much I love the Lord Jesus. After all, I'm the the apostle, and you you talk about a sold out lover of Christ. I, I, I am he, and no, that's not it. Paul realizing that, yes, love motivated this whole thing, this, this whole new life of his that he's living, this, this whole new purpose for which he now exists. It's a result of love. However, not his love for God but because He loved me and gave Himself for me. But but perhaps it's right there. You say, well, yeah, that's the problem. I mean, He's personalizing that. You're saying for me. I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time personalizing this thing for myself because if God really loved me, um, then, then why? why? Why has this happened in my life? Why is He allowing that? Or, or this, or I mean, I don't, I don't love it. I mean, so can it be love if I don't love it? <laughs> and that's really the primary issue in blindness to God's love. 
viewing our suffering through our eyes only and not through God's. Fixating our comprehension of God's love just based on the here and now, that which is passing, that which is temporal, completely centered in the physical and not the spiritual and eternal. You're judging God's love for you on the basis of what you see with your physical eyes, not on the basis of what you see with the spiritual eyes of faith that sees what He's already secured for you, right? In the Gospel. And promised you through His Son. Notice Paul's wording here, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. Not by what I'm seeing take place right before me right now. That's not, that's not how I'm living my life. But I'm living out this life in, in my bodily, mortal flesh, just like all of us have to do. We have to live out this life of faith. I'm, I'm doing it by faith. And so I'm not measuring God's love for me based on circumstances that are agreeable to my flesh or not but by the unmistakable statement of God's love in sending forth His Son, Jesus Christ, to this hell-bound world of ours for the purpose of setting captives free. That's why Christ came. Through Jesus' gruesome, torturous death on the behalf of others. Suffering for others. The overwhelming evidence and I suggested this in the last message of God's love, is the giving of Himself to humanity. I mean, who lays down their life for people they don't love? Anybody do that? It doesn't happen, does it? John said, here in His love, John says, not, not that we love God, but that He loved us. And how do we know? How, how do we know that God loved us? How, where's the proof of that? That God loves us. Well, he, he sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sin. To satisfy the wrath of God. To absorb God's wrath on our behalf. That's how we know. That's the evidence of it. That's love, really. That's love to the highest degree. Whatever setting your mind is on, on love, the highest degree of love ever is seen at the cross. There's no higher. Do you see that? No one has ever had a greater love than the Lord Jesus. The reality is God purposely brings really suffering into our lives, the lives of His people, actually to manifest His great love. That's what He does. And I know that can sort of sound contrary to reason, but it's nonetheless true. And the only way we can see it to be true is by having our minds set on things above, on that plane in which God is working and not stuck down here in the muck and mire of the earth, which is our tendency. Because earthbound mindedness is not able to see divine purposes. It can only interpret life through the lens of the here and now. Not on that which is timeless, that which is eternal, that which is most precious. And I realize, I, you know, I just finished saying that the truth about God's love is, for us is evidenced in the giving of His Son and not in our day-to-day -day circumstances. That is true. Even so, God does dispense in His providence affirmations of His love for us. And you know that's true, Christian. And I would suggest, suggest that is most often realized in the midst of suffering. And I mean, doesn't that make sense? Does that make sense to you? that the greatest expression of God's love for us, the suffering of His Son, is more clearly made manifest to us in our own suffering. Makes sense. It seems to be, in fact, it seems to be a very unique fit, a very unique fruit to suffering. And I, you know, my wife and I have just been blown away by the expression of God's love through the saints here. Uh, in recent days during our time of this affliction. And uh, I mean, there have been so many personal and thoughtful and unique and sacrificial gifts that have come our way. Expressions of God's love for us that we, we would have never seen. We would have never seen them to the extent that we have and are seeing them were it not for this 
gift of my wife's cancer. And I do choose to use that term gift because that's precisely what it is. A divine love gift. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, you see. And what makes it good? Not the gift in itself, but where the gift comes from. And the gift comes from a good God doing good things for His people. For those who He loves, who loved Me and gave Himself for Me. Jesus gave Himself. Not, not just as a human sacrifice for sin, for our forgiveness. Yes, that's a huge aspect of it. But He gave Himself for our sanctification. He gave Himself for our growth, our maturity in, in love and holiness and godliness in Christ-likeness. Jesus is very, very much committed to that end. So, dear brother or sister, you who struggle in believing God's love for you, I believe Christians can struggle with that. And that struggle seems to only be heightened as circumstances come into your life that are contrary to your perceived good. Know this, God's always working good. He's always working good. And and He may be giving you the very thing you most need to apprehend something of His great love for you. However, you're simply misinterpreting it as something else. Because your thoughts are more given to earthly mindedness instead of heavenly mindedness. And that can be a huge, I mean, it's a huge difference in how we interpret providence in our life. I think of the hymn writer, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. That face that cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was for you He was forsaken, the Lord Jesus. I mean, study that face. And when you do, surely all the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of that glory and grace of the face of the Lord Jesus. I mean, it is, it is uniquely, really, in the gift of suffering that we more intimately identify with Jesus' suffering and further see God's love for us. Christian, don't interpret life's happenings otherwise. Trust in God's integrity with your life. Trust this One who loved you by giving Himself for you. Paul says in another place, He who did not spare His own Son but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him freely give us or graciously give us all things? And part of those gracious things are trials, difficulties, opposition, hardships that serve to make us more and more like the Lord Jesus, right? Loving like He loves. Now, we noted last week the seven personal pronouns that Paul uses in verse 20. But I didn't draw to your attention the five times Paul uses the word live in verses 19 and 20. So that I might live to God. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. I mean, this thing's all about living. (laughs) It's all about life in Christ. Yes, Christians are crucified with Christ, but it's a crucified life that gets produced in being crucified with Christ. Christ lives in me. The One who gave Himself for me, He lives in me. Now, I don't even know how to begin to explain that to you. I don't. But it is what the Bible teaches. I could could sooner explain how how a caterpillar becomes a butterfly than I could explain your being, your death in Christ's death resulting in Christ's life in you. (laughs) But it's true if you're a Christian. It is. And you could no more keep a Christian from expressing this life of Christ within them than you could keep a butterfly from breaking out of its cocoon and bursting forth into all this newfound freedom and life. Yet on the other hand, we know, we do know 
We know about that life in us, don't we? We we know something of the element of Jesus within us because we think differently than we used to think. If you're a Christian, you do. We think differently about this world. We think differently about sin. We, We view things differently. Our desires have changed. Our whole reason for living is now altogether different than what it was before this holy metamorphosis took place within us that God did. We didn't do it. And this verse... And this verse here is one of the greatest indictments against a Christianity ravaged by sin. You don't get away with it in this verse. And why do I say that? Because where the life of Christ is present, the life of sin is not. Where Jesus places his dominion, sin's dominion's broken. It's lost its grip. And I'm not talking about sinless perfection. The Bible does not teach sinless perfection on this side of glory. It doesn't happen. It's not true. But the Bible does teach that sin will not have dominion in the life of the Christian. That is, it will not reign in those who have this life of Christ within them. Paul's saying here in verses 19 and 20, the law killed me in Christ. That, that old self's dead in Christ. But out of that death has arisen this life of Christ within me. My death to the law does not produce sinfulness. And my death to the law certainly doesn't produce lifelessness. The Bible doesn't teach that. But my death to the law produces this birth. It gives birth to life, real life, eternal life, so that I might live to God, Christ living in me. Christianity is no dead lip service religion. It's not. It's full of vibrancy and righteousness and life. And having received this life from Jesus Christ, this one who's crucified, the one who's crucified with Jesus Christ, now comes to Christ for direction on how to live this life that He's given them. We come to Christ for direction, not the law. The law is not our our teacher, our schoolmaster. It's not the one one who leads us in our life. Jesus is the one. He's the one ruling and reigning. He's the one we follow. And I really believe that's Paul's primary point in addressing the law in nearly every New Testament passage that that we run into. Our life is to be lived through Him, not Moses. If you notice, Bobby's example this morning, the transfiguration, what happened there? What was Peter, again, Peter's first thought? Oh, we got to get Moses involved here, right? And the bright cloud comes over and God says, this is my son, listen to him. And they fall on their face and when they lift up their eyes, guess what? Moses is nowhere to be found. Nor Elijah, those old covenant men, gone, disappeared, Jesus alone is standing. That's significant. In Him is life alone. And that life flows right out of the reality of these words here. And the reality of and the belief in He loved me and gave Himself for me. Yes, thank you. Then Paul makes this interesting follow-up statement in what seems like a summary to the whole narrative that he briefly kind of brings back into focus here in what he says here in verse 21. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Now Paul had not used the word grace since verse 9. And this is the first time he uses the word righteousness in the letter. And so in some ways, again, Paul's writing can seem a little bit disjointed. However, even though these these terms are, are, are new to the context here, the concepts they represent are not. And speaking of the grace of God, Paul would be speaking of the divine favor of God. The free bestowal of God's kindness and goodwill and favor upon man. The word translated nullify is the Greek word atheteo, which means to reject, to put aside, to do away with. 
Paul is saying, I do not set aside. I, I, don't, I don't do away with the grace of God in my proclamation of the gospel. In fact, quite the opposite. My, my gospel actually exalts the grace of God and makes Christ's atoning work absolutely necessary. Notice, notice the implication in the text. I do not nullify the grace of God for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. But you see, He did die for a purpose. And it was for righteousness. And the manner in which righteousness is obtained by my, in my gospel is actually God's grace. <laughs> because it's completely His work and His work alone. It's nothing that man does and contributes. And those who would hold on to the law actually make Christ's work on the cross, they're the ones that make Christ's work on the cross, meaningless. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. And of course, by righteousness, Paul would be referring to the righteousness or a righteous standing before God or one's justification that he labored to emphasize there three times in verse 16. That can never come by way of works of the law, ever. So Paul's either responding here in verse 21 to an accusation that his law-free gospel is a distortion of God's grace or an outright dismissal of it. Or Paul is simply summarizing the whole narrative, underscoring the fact the law could never provide anyone the righteousness they need to stand before God. Look there, if you look there in chapter 3, verse 21, Paul says, if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But it can't. <laughs> so it's not. And, and notice the connection Paul makes there with life and righteousness. So too, here in, in verse 20 and 21. Verse, verse 20 is all about life. Followed by Paul tying righteousness to it in verse 21. Righteousness, a product of this crucifixion leading to life. A product not by law, but by grace. And as far as Paul nullifying God's grace by preaching Christ alone for righteousness, he tells us there in Romans 5 too, that is precisely how God's grace comes to us. Through Christ. Christ alone. Through Him, he says. Through Christ. Not the law, but through Christ. We have obtained access by grace or by faith into the grace in which we stand. Through Christ. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And if you flip over there to, to chapter 5 of Galatians, verse 4, Paul says, You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by law, you have fallen away from grace. So, far from nullifying God's grace, Paul actually upholds it by maintaining Christ alone is our only access to it. And, and there's two ways. Two ways God's grace would actually be nullified. One, receiving it and continuing to live under the law as if Christ's cross and, and it hadn't satisfied or fulfilled anything. Which is exactly what Paul's implying by the rebuild, tear down language of verse 18. To seek righteousness in any other way through human doing and not resting completely in Jesus' doing is to reject the cross altogether. It's to openly proclaim Jesus died for no purpose. Secondly, the second way the grace of God is nullified is, would be to receive it and continue living in sin. As if Christ's cross was powerless to save from the very thing He condemned in His flesh, we're told in Romans. And those were the accusations being laid against Paul in his ministry that he answers at length in Romans. I mean, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, he says. How can we who died to sin continue in it? Continue to live in it? And you can easily see how such a statement would be made in light of what Paul reveals here in verses 19 and 20. Continue in sin? <laughs> the life of Christ is in me. How, how do you continue in sin when divinity has invaded me? 
How is that even possible? Jesus has taken up residence in my life. He's kicked that old filth-loving fool to the curb. He's gone. He's history. Oh yeah, he tries to come back. Tries to bite my heels at times. I got Christ in me. Well, the greatest, I believe the greatest implication of verse 21 is found in that last phrase. Then Christ died for no purpose. The implication? There is a purpose. There is a purpose for which Christ died. You see, Paul's argument here is he's making, that he's making against Peter, the circumcision party, the Judaizers, and due to their influence, these Galatians even, the argument's this. By restating and, and re, re, retaining the law, keeping the law, not letting go of the law, enforcing the law, you're making null and void the atoning work of Jesus on that tree. You're completely emptying the cross of its purpose, and it does have purpose, and it's a wonderful and glorious purpose. Not only to provide a righteous standing before God that the law could never do for sinners, but to actually make God's people righteous. That's the purpose of the cross. Through the cross, God answers man's greatest dilemma, and man's greatest dilemma is that he has a bad record and a bad heart. Everyone on the planet. Wrecked by sin. That's what this fall has left us with. Put, put that on your resume. I'm wrecked by sin. That might be the truest statement about you. Most certainly is true for those outside of a saving union with Jesus Christ. For the Christian motto, it should be wrecked by sin, resurrected by Christ. That should be the Christian's motto. Resurrected so that I might live to God. Not with the same old God-hating, sin-loving heart I possessed before Jesus stepped in and saved my soul. Now I have this new heart, this new life. In fact, it's, it's, the, it's the life of Christ. It's not even my own. And now I see that His purpose on that cross was ultimately to change my purpose for living. No longer for myself, but for Him and His glory. And let me tell you something. Only Jesus could have done that. Only. Flesh and blood could not do that. Flesh and blood tried and failed over and over and over. But then Jesus came in and glory filled my soul. And only He could do that. And when such a Christ as this loves me and gives Himself for me in the manner in which He did, my response is not, well, let's see how, how carnal I can live my life now. No. It's not, let me set up a bunch of legalistic standards so I can prove myself to God and then look down my nose judging other people. They just don't quite measure up to my standard. No, that's not, that's not the response in the wake of butterfly-making grace. That's not what the response is. The response is, I want to love and serve and follow this One who has so incredibly and inexplicably loved me Amen. of all people. See, a saving Gospel response is one of gratitude, not duty. Where you have folks driven by duty, you have folks that are not seeing crucified love satisfying all that is needed for sinners before a holy God. God does all that He does in saving sinners, not just to give them escape out of hell. He does what He does in the manner in which He does it so as to win our hearts and make us worshipers of the Most High God. It's to restore really our original created state. It's, it's to make us fulfillers of the greatest commandment, right? To love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and our neighbor as ourself. Without the Gospel, it's, just, it, it's impossible to do. Impossible. And without the Gospel, any attempt to do so is just vain, dead duty. Duty, religion, Duty religion is a Christless religion. 
Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus most certainly calls His people to obey Him. And obedience is not governed or regulated by how we feel, but by what Jesus' own worth. But God has no interest in His people heartlessly jumping through external acts in effort to please Him. None at all. He's most interested in His people serving Him out of gratitude for what He has done for them and who He is. And it's in that expression, the expression of gratitude, that He's most exalted and glorified. Piper Piper uses that illustration of the... Actually, it's himself. Of getting his wife flowers. He goes and gets his wife flowers and shows up at the door. and She answers the door and he says, here you go, I fulfilled my duty. That's not what God's after in our lives. Now, now you tell me, ladies, is that, is that sweeping you off your feet? Does that send chills of rapturous love down your spine? No, that's not, that's not what a wife desires to hear from her man. Nor God from His people. In fact, you might hear shortly after that, you might hear some chopping in the kitchen. I got your duty. Chopping away at the food. She calls you to the table. You sit down and she got Tina Turner playing in the background. What's love got to do with it? And she serves you her duty. A dry, unseasoned, cold food. But she did it. She did her duty. Now hopefully none of you ladies are getting your doctrinal input on love from Tina Turner, but I trust you get the point. <clears throat> but, but near duty falls so short of Christ's purpose in saving us. It does. And it really projects a mindset about God that's not much different than Pharaoh. More bricks! Come on, more bricks! Do, do, do! Where our serving just become more slavish duty than ardent, the ardent love that God desires from His people. If that's true of us, we do well to sit and gaze at the crucified One with whom we've been crucified and meditate more on He who loved me and gave Himself for me. Because you can't come away from that with a duty mind. You don't. You just don't. Christ died for a purpose that far exceeds the provision of a legal standing before God. He died to deposit His life within us and make us really to make us God lovers. That's what He's done. <laughs> I think uh, Jeff Volker calls it an incurable God lover. I like that. <clears throat> so we do well to ask ourselves... What does my life communicate to the Lord? What do my actions say about Him or to Him even? Am I offering God the flowers of duty? Or am I offering the Lord the flowers of my gratitude? As frail and unimpressive as they may be, like I said, we've received so many thoughtful and generous gifts during this time of, of Shirley's sickness. I, and I was thinking upon them in light of the, this context. I mean, what if accompanying those gifts was a card that simply read, here you go, my duties fulfilled. Wouldn't that completely stain the whole statement that the gift is supposed to represent? It certainly would reduce your estimation of the individual who gave it. I don't know, maybe perhaps you have an appreciation for their honesty. But But it it would do nothing in terms of of communicating love, right? Just think about what it would say about one, the individual giving it, and two, the recipient of it. Thankfully, that's not been the case at all. Rather, the communication within the gift has been the greater blessing. 
As I previously stated, it has been a means of exp- God expressing His love and compassion and tenderness to us in ways we've, <laughs> we've not experienced. Remember, brethren, we laid hands on my wife a few weeks ago and, and, and the Lord said no. This is just one reason why. <laughs> just one that I can identify right now. God is in the business of enlarging our hearts for Him. And His ways of doing that are far beyond ours. That's the purpose of the cross. Something law will never reveal. So in, in, in wrapping up both this chapter and this message, I, I just want to ask two different questions. One aimed at Christians, one aimed at those who are not. And this is kind of just taking in the scope of really since the Peter encounter. The question I want to ask you, Christian, is really one that I got from Gordon Fee reflecting on this chapter. In light of what Paul reveals and the tension that took place there in Jerusalem and in Antioch, here in Galatians 2, where law seriously threatened the truth of the Gospel, So much so, Paul's pronouncing anathemas at the beginning of the chapter. Or the letter, rather. In light of that, how much has the reality that the Son of God loves me freed you from the shackles of legalistic living and caused you to sit in constant wonder of Him? I think that's what verse 20 should produce in your life. I think it's a great question to ask ourselves. How much is just sitting in wonder of Christ got away from us? I tell you this, had Peter's mind been meditating upon the wondrous truths presented here in verse 20, he would have not made Paul's narrative. As an example of how one's lack of clarity in their relationship to the law can cause their conduct to not be in step with the truth of the Gospel. An apostle. And if it can happen to an apostle, it can happen to you and me. Legalism is the enemy of Christ's Gospel. And a hindrance to spiritual growth. But lastly, for those of you that are lost, I sought to highlight here at the end the word, this last word written in this chapter, purpose. You see, the, the enforcement of law renders Christ's death to be of no purpose. But a proper understanding of the Gospel makes Christ's death the greatest purpose on earth. And my question to you sitting here today without Christ, what is your purpose? Why are you here? God brought you here. I can assure you that. What are you living for? What does the life you currently live say about your life's purpose? Now, I was thinking in Scriptures, God is so kind to us. He even reasons with us who are so unreasonable. <laughs> And he's like James was saying earlier, none of us Gentiles, we're a room full of Gentiles. God could have not opened this thing up to us easily and He would have been right and just. But God reasons with us. He comes down to where we're at. He invites us to reason with Him. Come now, let us reason together, He says. Your sins. And He compares our sins to like scarlet red blood thrown on a white sheet. That's the stain of your guilt before this pristine, holy God and His law. You see, we've been talking about how God's people are no longer governed by the law, but that's not true of you who are outside of Christ. God's law constantly hounds you, follows you everywhere you go. You cannot escape it. Guilty, guilty, Guilty. That's the verdict. Guilty. And you currently sit there now, guilty, rightly condemned by God in your sin. 
And all the sin that you so love will betray you on that day when you stand before His holy presence and you see the God whom you now hate. It will not be pretty. And God says to you today, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. That, that's, what he, that's the kind of God we're talking about. A clean, spotless sheet. And you don't do anything. Christ has done it all. But you see, this thing requires death. It requires being crucified with Christ. The Christ of Galatians 2.20. You have to die with the Savior on that tree. No more your way. It's His way. Or it's no way. You know, another interesting um, thing the monarch butterfly teaches us, those that are located on the, on the, the east side of the Rockies, it, it doesn't matter what state they reside in as long as they're on the east side of the Rockies, even all the way as far as Canada. All, all of a sudden, in mid-August, early September, they begin to migrate. They all, they all start traveling in unison. It's like... And they, they don't express individual wills of saying, well, you know, I think I'll spend this winter in Florida. And, you know, uh, well, you know, we're going to try, try South Texas. This, you know, we're heading over to your, Arizona and... Uh, that doesn't happen. All of them. One direction. One way. One destination. All of them. One destination in mind. And it's South Central Mexico forming a sanctuary amongst the fir trees there. That is really a phenomenal sight to see. That man just happened to stumble upon. Not... I don't know how many X years ago. But they stay there for about four months. Just billions of them sitting there. It's like they're all programmed. There they go. Just, just one mission, one place, one purpose to journey in the same direction. Same destination. You see, they must follow the call to go. There's no fight, no self-will. I'm going to do this. I got this. I want that. A complete resignation to follow. To follow the way they're being called to follow. In that respect, they provide another illustration and creation of the Christian life. Followers of Jesus. The way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way. There's only one. If you would have Jesus, you must follow Him. And there is a cost. You must follow Him. It requires you saying, no longer I, Lord. I'm done running the show. This, this gig is over. I surrender all to You and trust You, Jesus, to be my all in all. My death penalty my righteousness, my Savior. I've got nothing to offer You. Naked I come to You for dress. Lord, please cleanse me of my scarlet sins and wrap me in the robes of Your righteousness. Lord, let me live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. If you've never done that, if you've never come to Jesus Christ on His terms, I, I bid you to do so today. Don't presume upon God. Don't presume upon His offer of kindness. Because it might be your last. Father, we are thankful for these two chapters. We're thankful for such a Christ. Oh Lord, to have Your life dwelling in us. What a thing is that. And Lord, we're finding out the greatness of Your loving heart and in, in, in Your Word and in providence. We're thankful, Lord. 
Lord, thank you for allowing us to be part of this. Lord, thank you for making us butterflies. We're all going in the same direction, that destination, that one place of glory where we'll all gather together and you get all the glory and praise and we'll be made more, we'll be made like you, Lord. We'll see you face to face. Give us grace to, to walk in this life with that hope and that joy set before us. Lord, have mercy on those plain religion, those hardened in their sin, those who have heard and still not come, those who refuse to bow the knee. Lord, would you break their will and do like you did, Paul, on that Damascus road. Radically convert them to Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.